Oh, I guess I don't know what happened. I was streaming, but then I wasn't. So you probably didn't hear anything that I just said. <laughs> so I moved, as you can see, all of the computer stuff for my videos into the back where the assembly line is. It's not in the front office anymore. It just made a lot more sense because all of our design work now is remote. So the only time we're doing, I'm coming in is when we're doing stuff back here. And it was just a pain kind of going back and forth, like trying to do like the EMC stuff or any of the other videos and all my camera stuff was up front. So hopefully this will make a lot more sense. Oh, there's an echo on the audio. So if you're hearing just kind of like a little bit of a reverb, that's just because this is a super big space. I don't have any like sound treatment yet, but nice background photo. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I had used the, uh, yeah, I don't know what was up with the stream. So like I had said, it was streaming but then it got disconnected for some reason. So I don't know if that's something on YouTube's end, but definitely let me know if it's still not working. And like normal, I'm going to, I'm just gonna kind of sit here uh, and wait a few minutes, maybe like five, 10 minutes, just give some people some time to come in. But uh, so yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions or want to talk about anything in the meantime before I actually get started. I don't know if this is going to be a very popular stream. I'm kind of thinking it won't be, which is funny in a way because I get a ton of questions about different like solder paste and what to use. And honestly, in the last like I don't know, like two weeks, I've probably had like four or five questions, not just on uh, the Microtype Engineering Discord, but on a couple others that I'm in. So I do think there's a lot of people who are interested in this, whether or not they will actually tune in. I have no idea, but I guess we'll see, hopefully, because I think a lot of this stuff, I mean, I know for like me, for us, when we were getting started with doing assembly, figuring out the paste and figuring out exactly like what is important and choosing solder paste was probably, if not the biggest issue, it was probably the second or third biggest issue. So we'll see. But yeah, let me know if you guys want to, uh, if you have any other questions or anything before I actually start the lecture. Nice of you doing a bespoke video for me after my water wash fiasco. Yeah, so you were you were one of the people who had asked about it, and I do have a, uh, I am going to be talking a little bit about the uh, water wash paste, but uh, that, and then I know a lot of the storage conditions in that other Discord, we were talking about that too, like whether or not the like the data sheet and the manufacturer's recommendations how much of that you should follow how much of it you should ignore how important it is or how much you can just omit it but yeah we'll see hopefully it uh it turns out pretty good one nuisance that's gonna take me a little bit to figure out is i don't have like a third monitor here for the chat so I don't think I'm going to be able to even remotely see the chat when I'm doing the lecture, but I guess we'll see how that goes. But yeah, make sure if you have any questions while I'm doing this, click on the uh, pinned, uh, the pinned link that I have. It's a click up form and you can submit a question and I'll go through it at the end and I'll be able to answer them at the end. So I'm not kind of interrupting the stream while it's ongoing. Nice stream thumbnail, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, I'm using the power of uh, PowerPoint to just do the design ideas for that. Maybe use split screen or use a phone. Yeah, the problem is, you know, actually, I'm going to mess with that right now. So when I do the, when I do like the PowerPoint for the presentation, it automatically does it on second, on two screens which I don't really need because, oh, hide presenter view. Oh, well that was easy. 
Okay, yes. Now we should be good. Let me just swap this. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll be able to do it now. So I'll be able to have the uh, chat on the left-hand side, so that should be fine. Not that, again, I'm obviously going to be using it that much, but it'll be there just in case. Uh, all right. So maybe give it like a couple more minutes. Yeah, I mean, there's only like 12 people watching normally for my for my streams. There'd be at least like two, three, four times that. So I, I figured this probably wouldn't be as popular as one of the design videos, but I do get requests for this and then an actual like full length video, which I am probably going to do eventually, but it's just kind of a pain. Not to be an audio complainer, but increasing the level could be helpful. All right, I can do that one second. Like I said, I'm still figuring all this out. Okay, let me know how that is, if it's a little bit too much or if I could do it a little bit more. It's super hard for me to tell. And like I said, I just literally set all this up like two, three days ago. But it's definitely now a little bit louder. At least it is on my end. And I can go up a decent bit more if, if need be. Sounds good. Fantastic. All right. Uh, let me see. There should be soft fixes for the audio. I do not know what you mean by a soft fix. But the big issue is the audio in this space. I need to get some sound damping. I mean, it's a big open space with not a whole lot on the wall. And that kind of makes it pretty terrible for audio, but we'll see. But generally, you check your own sound and then tell the users to put up their volume. Yeah, I mean, it's honestly, I'm right at negative 9-ish dB, which is at the absolute max you want it to be before it starts clipping. So really, any more that I go up, it's going to be kind of dangerously uh, too high, but we'll see. As in software, oh yeah, you can do filters for getting rid of echo, but they normally don't sound that amazing. Loctite GC10 says not to put in refrigerator temp. Should I ignore that and refrigerate anyway for longer life? I'll get into some of the shelf stable stuff and I'm actually talking about GC10 in the video. Can you start your stream on OBS and on YouTube do return stream or something? So basically it's private till you're ready. Oh, sure. I mean, that's what I do when I do this. So I'll disappear for like three seconds. So I can put on a different scene so I can cancel it out whenever. Or if I have to like go to the bathroom or something, I can do this and just change it back and forth. So yeah, I usually have it live before I go. So, okay. So there are like 11 people. So I guess that's, <laughs> that's about all that's going to be for this, which is fine. Hi, you have a great space now, great progress. Keep on this way. Well, thank you. I will do my best. Okay, so let's do this. I will get this ready. So from beginning. Okay. So let me adjust this. All right. Well, solder, maybe a topic one can watch later. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe it'll get views later on. I am not holding my breath, though. Oh, do you guys want... I actually didn't have it set up. Do you guys want my face in here? I know last time it kept blocking the screen. Is that distracting having it there, or is that beneficial kind of like a presenter view? I can do either or. Just let me know what you think is better or rather less distracting, and I can add it if you want. No comments. Oh, yeah, I have this on the super long latency, so I'm not going to hear it. Your face is not important, can't see you. Yeah, do you want that? Love the videos, cheers from CA. Well, cheers right back. This is better, I think. Okay, so yeah, let me just, just since I've done the other two like this, 
So yeah, it's like 50-50 with or without. So let me go ahead and do this one without my face. And then at the end, we can kind of see what people think since I've done the last two with my face. And it's kind of annoying me having to constantly move it. So with all that said, so yeah, make sure to check the link on the pinned post that I made or the pinned message that I made on here. If you have any questions, post on there, and then I will answer them at the end just to keep it a little more clean so I'm not constantly distracting. So with all that said, let us begin. So yeah, this is going to be on, there's a lot of substance here, so I'm kind of focusing just on the paste itself. I'm not going to be talking about the actual, like, screen printing nearly as much. I'm planning on doing, and maybe I can do it on one of the next live lecture series, I can do on the printing process and what kind of considerations, troubleshooting, stuff like that are important. But just to keep it kind of simplistic, I'm just going to focus on the solder paste itself and what I kind of value as important. And a lot of this, other than like the Rojas part, most of what I'm talking about is based on my experience in running an assembly line. So it'll differ from what you read online in some ways. It'll be in line with what you see online in some ways, but it's based on what I've seen. So just keep that in mind. It's obviously not set in stone. So the first thing is why is there even, why is it even warrant a video like this? Like I know when I had posted this on, I forget where someone had even jokingly said, oh, you don't just go and pick the first solder paste that you use. And it's like, sure you can, and it can work. But something that is interesting, and you can ask anybody who has run an assembly line, that the actual, the most important part of running an assembly line is the printing. That is, and they've done research, and like 85% of all defects that you'll find in a surface mount assembly is can be traced back to the printer. And it is absolutely my experience that that is completely accurate. Because you have to keep in mind, with everything downstream from a printer, mainly the oven and the pick and place, they kind of either work or they don't. Your pick and place is either placing the part correctly or it's not. A printer, you can really never have a perfect print. It can always be improved. There can always be issues that come up, even when it's working in the morning. Maybe in the afternoon, it got a little bit hotter and now your printing isn't working. So printing really is an important step and doing prototypes, no matter if you're doing one or two boards or if you're doing 10,000, if your printing isn't good, you're pretty much screwed. So while you can just kind of be lackadaisical and just use whatever paste you want, it's really going to bite you in the end. So it's definitely something that if you're doing this a lot or you're doing enough boards, it is something that you're going to have to keep in mind. So I'm opening this up. I wasn't planning on going into this in a ton of detail and I still probably am not. I'm just gonna kind of skim over some of this stuff. So Rojas, what is it and why do we care? Basically the long and short of it is mainly in the EU, then China, Japan, some other countries, they banned certain materials for solder paste. The main one is obviously lead. So if it's a Rojas paste, it can't have lead in it. There's a lot of other chemicals and like halides and some other portions that you can't have, but it's by far leaded solder that is what's excluded. And unfortunately, leaded solder performs better. In, and I put basically every, it's pretty much every single category there is, leaded paste will outperform lead free. And the environmental health hazards that are portrayed about lead are unbelievably overstated. And lead free solder is still hazardous. Tin is a heavy metal, you don't want that in your body, you don't want it to be in the environment. Silver is incredibly toxic to the ecosystem in uh, water into fish. It's actually more toxic for fish and aquatic animals than it is for us. 
And a quote from a NASA article says that, and this is something that comes up a lot, is you could have millions, billions of circuit boards or ICs that were all made lead-free, and it is completely dwarfed by 100 automotive batteries. Lead-acid batteries account for so much lead. And other studies have shown that lead just flat out doesn't even actually break down and get into the environment. It just kind of sits there because it kind of is sticky and binds to whatever it is in. And there's also no evidence that any lead in soldering environments, like in an assembly line, actually hurts people. They've done studies and have shown that people who are soldering technicians have no more lead in their body than anybody else. And on top of that, we don't really use or didn't use that much lead to begin with. And this is what I was saying. You really can't get lead in your body from soldering unless you eat it or you're rubbing it on your hands as you eat it. So like I'd said, lead acid batteries are wildly more prevalent in how much lead is used, but they're exempt from virtually all Rojas legislation, which is kind of funny. And if you're still not convinced, and I'll publish the uh, PowerPoint after, here's just an excerpt of four or five articles, all from either government entities or from a one is from the IEEE. So these are not just run of the mill little articles and they for the most part will back up what I just had mentioned. But like I said, I don't really want to get super political, but I felt like I needed to at least brush that topic because it really is a travesty that billions and billions of dollars have been spent in a environmentally at best equal product at worst it's worse than what leaded was and it's an inferior product which is really sad but it is what it is so to end this unfortunately what does the lowly cm or oem or hobbyist have to say about that it doesn't matter you still have to abide by it so for us as a cm we do not use any leaded solder whatsoever while we can for a lot of products because the majority of what we do is strictly in the U.S. It's kind of not worth it because we would essentially have to have two lines or at least two separate printers to be able to switch between leaded and lead free, which we did at the start, but it is just not worth it. And the other thing that kind of sucks with this is almost all money and research goes into lead-free solder now. So all of the new fluxes that are out there, the thermally stable, the non-refrigerated, they're all going to be lead-free. Just because if you're a manufacturer, why in the world are you going to spend millions or billions of dollars on new solder flux if it's going to be used by a very, very small percentage of the industry if you wouldn't it doesn't make sense if you are a hobbyist and you're in a rojas country or a country that does not follow rojas just use leaded solder uh, it really doesn't make sense to use lead free unless it's just because you want to use a specific solder that has a flux that you need or want mainly that's going to be the thermally stable the non-refrigerated which if that's the case, yes, you do have a tough decision, but honestly, I would still use leaded solder. It's just a lot easier to work with. So for the rest of the presentation, the majority of it, I'm going to cover each one of these parameters in a little more detail and kind of flesh out what they are, what matters. And then I'll also mention kind of which one I would suggest. And I'm going to give some suggestions and I'm gonna give a couple actual paste brand and series suggestions. I've always been hesitant of doing that just because depending on exactly what you're doing, it varies wildly, but I know people just wanna have an idea of what they should use. So I'm gonna do my best to mention that, but just again, don't take it for face value. Try a few out, see which one you like. They all pretty much can work pretty well depending on what you're doing. So the first and the biggest thing is what type of alloy. So what type of actual metal is in the solder? And for Rojas, the main one that's used for surface mount by 
far is SAC 305. And this is a ton of tin and it has a little bit of silver. And the next one is SN100C. So these are the two big ones. The advantage of the SN100C is it does not have any silver, so it's a bit cheaper. And that's kind of a big thing with lead-free solders is you try to have the least amount of silver in it. And then there's a few different uh, alloys that are comparable with SAC 305, but they don't have silver. That's just to try to save money. And it's not money that makes sense for a hobbyist or even for us as a small CM. It's only if you're doing millions and millions of units, you try to cut out as much silver as you can to save money. So for anything else, SAC 305 is what's typically used. And then there's bismuth bearing solders, which the bismuth lowers the melting point quite a bit. So you can have low temp paste that, that have a little bit of bismuth. And this isn't a low temp for the most part that is used in end products. It can be, there are some formulas, but the majority of the bismuth containing alloys are going to be used for rework to be able to like remove parts that you don't wanna to have to heat a lot. And then when we get into the non Rojas, the big one is obviously SN63 PB37, which is 63% tin, 37% lead. There's a slight variation which cuts down the amount of tin and lead by a percent each. Oh, and I did not do the second percentage right. That's supposed to be 2% silver. And I've used this when we were doing leaded paste. It's supposed to be a little bit higher performance. Honestly, I never really noticed it. It's a little bit more expensive and it seemed to perform to me identical. So your mileage may vary on that. And then with non Rojas paste or alloys, the equivalent of the bismuth bearing is indium bearing. And that does the same thing as it does in the SAC 305 is it lowers the temperature and a big, big thing that you have to keep in mind. If you are using a bismuth bearing low temperature paste, you cannot use that with a non Rojas paste. So if you use like SN 63 PB 37, so you're doing a leaded board, you throw it through the oven, it comes out and you have to rework it. You cannot rework it with a bismuth bearing paste. It'll end up lowering the melting temperature incredibly high because it reacts with the lead. So if you have to use a low temperature, alloy for reworking leaded paste it has to be indium bearing and you'll see this as a big warning on all data sheets of bismuth bearing paste it's really important i don't know the chemistry behind the alloy that it forms but bismuth and lead does not go well if you're going to be using it in an end product so just keep that in mind it normally isn't a big deal because you would never even have it if you're using a Rojas paste or vice versa, just because they're not compatible, whatever. It would only never be an issue if you're doing leaded and lead free, which not a lot of places are doing nowadays. So then what of those alloys should you use? What would I suggest you use? And on the same token, what do we use? So if it's not Rojas, either one of the leaded paste, like I said, they perform basically the same. I wouldn't get the silver bearing just because it's a couple bucks more for, in my opinion, it doesn't really do much. And then if you are going to be doing Rojas and you're doing SMT works, you're using solder paste, just use SAC 305. It's pretty much the gold standard and there's not a whole lot of reasons to not use it, at least for most applications. In advantage of the SN100C, it's, it's eutectic, which means it reflows, it hardens and melts at the exact same temperature. So it tends to be a little bit shinier. It doesn't shrink as much and it makes it a heck of a lot easier to solder with through holes. So if I was getting some leaded, some lead free solder, I would just get SAC 305 for solder paste. That's what we use. And then for through hole soldering, I would get, and what we use is SN100C. It's honestly 
pretty close to as easy as soldering with just standard leaded solder. It's much easier than SAC 305, but you don't normally use it for surface mount just because it has a few temperature or a few degrees, what, five, 10 degrees higher. So you have to have a little bit higher and hotter reflow profile, which you normally don't want to. And yeah, so like I said, just used in through hole and do keep in mind, you don't want to rework a surface mount board or a surface mount pad using SN100C if it was reflowed with SAC 305. It doesn't form any crazy alloy like I'd mentioned with the bismuth. It's just you don't want to. If you're reworking a board, use whatever alloy was on that board originally just so you don't have to worry about any sort of incompatibilities. And yep, much more important. So the original SN100C is, oh, we got some spammers. Daniel, I'll let you take care of them. <laughs> um, so uh, for the SN100C, that is under or was under patent by AIM soldering. And they charge a lot of money for it. So the patent expired. And now ChipQuick makes their equivalent solder, which is CQ100GE. It's the germanium doped. It performs, in my mind, identical, and it's a lot cheaper. And you can get it from a Mauser or a DigiKey, I believe. And that's what we use. It performs really well. And like I said, pretty similar to just a standard leaded paste. So the next big thing, and the next thing just as important as what alloy you're going to use, is which flux you should use. And this clearly could be its entirely own lecture. And I have spent, I don't even know how many hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours of research and testing different types of fluxes and what we should use. So I'm going to do my best to kind of break it down, but just know I am not going to be doing this part justice. There's just not enough time here, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. So there's three main categories of fluxes. There's no clean, which is just NC, water soluble, WS, and then rosin based, RMA, RA, oh, and it should be R. So there's R flux, which is just rosin flux. There's RA, which is rosin activated, and then RMA, which is rosin mildly active. And I'll mention what those are here in a minute. So for no clean fluxes, so they can either be rosin or resin based. And I know I mentioned there's a category of rosin based fluxes. It's infuriating to me. They are technically a separate category, but you can have no clean rosin fluxes. So, and I'll get to this when I get to the rosin section, but for the most part, unless it's a rosin activated flux, it's still going to be no clean. So you can kind of treat them the same. And I'm sorry, I know that's confusing, but it is what it is. They're technically a different classification, but they can still be no clean. But the majority of no clean fluxes that are out there are resin based. So they don't use natural rosin. They use a synthetic version. And that's kind of a differentiating factor between them, but they can still be rosin based, which is really frustrating. So kind of like how with the lead free solder, the majority of the money and the technological advances in the industry are going towards that type of solder, that type of technology. It's the same with flux. The majority of money out there is going into no clean. So all of the advancements you see, or most of the advancements you see are going to be in no clean fluxes just because the majority of industry uses it. And unless you have a specific reason to wash a board and to clean it, you don't do it because it costs a lot of money and time. So more CMs and OEMs will use no clean than anything else by a pretty significant margin. So just keep that in mind. They have a medium process window. So that means a decent, there's a decent variability in a reflow profile that will work. It doesn't have to be absolutely precise and you'll still get a decent reflow. It's not the narrowest, but it's certainly not the widest. And it is really non impacted by environmental conditions. So if your factory is a little bit hotter or more critically, a little bit humid, 
No clean flux is not that impacted by it as compared to water soluble, which we'll get to in a minute. It has a pretty long abandon time, which abandon time is how long after stenciling a board it can stay, how long after using a stencil that bead of solder can stay on that stencil without it drying out and going bad. No clean lasts pretty long compared to some of the others. And you can clean it, even though it's called no clean. That simply means you don't have to clean it but a lot of times you can clean them, but you typically will have to use solvents. You can't just use like just d distilled or DI water. You have to have something in it. Some saponifiers will work, but typically it's a more aggressive solvent because it has to be physically dissolved. So the next flux is water soluble. This is by far the highest performing flux. When you get everything dialed in, this thing just eats away at oxides. You get unbelievably good joints and as long as your process is good nothing else will perform as well as it it has a really short process window and this is something actually when i was just doing some research with this i saw some conflicting some conflicting articles that said it has the longest processing window maybe some but in my experience water soluble simply because it's so active and it's so aggressive it tends to burn off in an oven really quickly. So if your profile isn't really on point, it's going to be burned off too quick and then it's not going to perform very well. And you can validate this by looking at like some of AIM's data sheets. If you compare a SAC 305 alloy with water soluble flux compared to no clean flux, the process window for the water soluble will be a lot shorter. So I guess in some scenarios it can be longer, but as a whole, no, I would disagree. You have to have a pretty good profile for it. And it's impacted by humidity greatly because it's water soluble. So if you are really humid in your environment, it's not going to perform very well naturally because it dissolves in water. And when I was evaluating some pastes here with one of the reps from Alpha, he even said that companies that are in Florida, regardless of how tight, tightly they control their environment, they really do not recommend water soluble paste just because it's really hard to keep it from absorbing too much moisture, which of course deteriorates it quite a bit. And it has a short abandon time for the same reasons. If it's sitting on your stencil, it's going to absorb too much water and it's not going to perform very well. Oops. And the biggest thing with water soluble, you absolutely have to clean it after reflow. If you don't, it's going to continue to be active and it's going to cause corrosion. It's going to eat away at your board and cause a really, really bad time. But the advantage is it's super easy to clean. You can literally clean some of these just with hot water. You don't even have to use anything in it. Normally you still use some sort of aqueous cleaner if for nothing else, it's to lower the surface tension, which lets it get underneath parts a little bit easier. If not, it'll kind of be repelled and won't fully clean it, which again can cause a huge issue with not being able to clean them. And one other thing with this, a lot of times component manufacturers will recommend against water soluble flux, especially if it's a BGA, if it's a uh, something with a thermal window underneath it like a thermal pad or if it's like a module that has a shield because if you can't fully clean it you're screwed you have to get every single trace of flux off of it so if you're not able to do that efficiently your board's going to be trashed so just keep that in mind now for the rosin flux again i said there's quite a bit of an overlap between this and the no clean but there are different levels of activity. Like I had said earlier, R is rosin, RMA mildly active, and RA is rosin active. You don't really see R ever, just rosin. It's super non-active and it's really hard to use. Just like you don't see rosin active very often, that's more for like joining like stainless steel and like you'll see it in like plumbing applications. So almost always when you see it in the electronics industry, it'll be RMA. And at that point, it's pretty comparable with just a standard no clean flux. 
but you usually will get a longer process window. These are like the solder paste and the wire solder that a lot of times you would get at like a Radio Shack when you would use it. It's like super sticky. It gets all over the board and it's just kind of a mess to use. But because of that, it is usually has one of the longest process windows. It doesn't burn off very well. And just like the standard no clean, since it's not dissolvable in water, it doesn't get affected by humidity that much. So you can use it in Florida without having to worry about it soaking in too much water. Same thing with no clean. It has a pretty long abandon time and you normally don't have to clean it, but you normally, a lot of times you do just because it can be really messy. It can draw in a lot of dust because sometimes it won't dry to a hard shell and it stays sticky which is a really, really big pain. And it's not as easy to clean as water soluble, but it is much easier normally to clean than no clean flux, but you do need a saponifier, which a saponifier just reacts with rosin to form a soap. And how is YouTube, how is Google not able to fix spam? Like, come on guys, you ban people from posting a link, yet you don't ban someone with a name like that? Like, come on. So, and this is what we were talking about before the stream. So a bonus formulation is what's called water wash flux. And this is a really strange category because technically manufacturers will quantify it as no clean and it's RO or R0, L0, which I'm not gonna get into any of the different types of IPC classifications. But basically that means per IPC, it doesn't have to be cleaned, but they claim it is water soluble, which is a little bit kind of strange. And there's very little literature out there on this. You really have to rely on the manufacturer themselves for it. And we have used two different brands of water wash flux. One of them, I really wasn't even usable. The other worked but it had such an incredibly short process window. We had to fine tune our oven to where I think like the last zone was like 340 degrees, like ridiculous. Like it had to be such a fast profile or else it would just completely burn off all of the flux. But I will say once we figured out the profile, it was such an easy clean, such an easy paste to clean. It just came right off with a saponifier and cleaned up really nice. So I really wish there was more info out there on these and more long-term tests, but there really isn't. So use these as your discretion and caution because if you do use too long of a process window, it turns out terrible. You get tons of solder balls. It just does not wet at all, but it can be good. Just keep that in mind. So now what type of flux should you use? What would I recommend? Unless you actually have a reason to wash your boards, just use no clean. It's way easier. You're not going to screw up your board by improperly washing them. And if it's a no clean that's designated as, and I meant to say like a resin no clean, or you can also use a rosin. So an RMA that doesn't require cleaning. They're essentially the same. What we use is a resin based no clean typically just because that's kind of the ones that we found work the best for us but it doesn't really matter and you can use any of them and they're going to be about the same if you use a water wash flux i would consider that mandatory to clean even though they say it's no clean i wouldn't trust something out in the world that is dissolvable in water even if they say it doesn't have to be cleaned, but that is just me. You can use whatever you want. So now the next spec, and this is specific to the metal content in the paste itself, and that is the powder size. So they start at type two and they go all the way up to, here it says six, you don't really see six. It's normally, it's really three, four, and five. And all that entails is how big are the solder balls in what range? And they, you normally would think, oh, the smaller the powder, the better it's going to be. It'll fit into apertures better and take up less room. 
And while that's true, you have an issue with there's going to be a lot more solder balls just because they're obviously a lot smaller. You have to have more flux to hold everything together. And the big one is it's way more prone to oxidizing because there's a lot more surface area because there's a lot more actual balls in there. So if you use it, you're going to have a longer or a shorter abandon time and you might have to mess with your profile to make sure that it's not too long to where it's extending the flux activation time and it's more expensive because it's a more expensive process to make the balls smaller so for the majority of the time just buy type 4 type 4 works for pretty much everything unless you get under like 0201s and super fine pitch parts or bgas if you're only using like really big surface mount parts, you can get away with type three, but honestly the price difference between three and four nowadays isn't that big. It's only like 10 bucks normally. And the oxidation of type four isn't that big of a deal. So we use pretty much type four for everything, but type three can work. So just keep that in mind. And there's a rule that you should have a five ball distance between whatever aperture you're using. So if you have a, I don't know, like a, a 20 mil aperture or a 10 mil aperture, whatever paste ball size you use, you should be able to line up five balls and it fit across the aperture size. And there's like, if you go back to this, it'll say what pitch and what size aperture you should use. So you don't actually have to calculate that. You can just kind of look at it. So now storage conditions. So traditionally and still by far the majority of paste require refrigeration and up until, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, that's just how it was. They all required it. And when it's in a refrigerator, you have to make sure you don't heat it up. I know some people will put it in like a warm water bath, but that is a really, really bad idea. It can cause the flux to separate out. And if you actually are heating it, it can start to cause the flux to activate, which you really, really don't want to do. So just the rule of thumb is you set it out the night before, and then the next day you'll be good to go. But they usually specify like six to eight hours, which again is kind of overnight. And this is a big thing, and I actually on one of the other discords we were talking about this. So pretty much all solder paste data sheets will specify once you bring a paste up to temperature, you cannot refrigerate it again. And I get that sounds really, really painful and like it's not actually required. And while I can see where you're coming from, you have to see where they're coming from. If you heat up or warm up a paste and then open it up and use it, there's now humidity in that container. When you go and cool it back down, it's going to cause that humid air to condensate. So you're going to get moisture in the paste. So I would be lying if I said that we have not done that. We certainly have. But just keep in mind that every time you warm up and cool down a paste, it's going to be absorbing water. And if you're using a no clean flux, you can usually get away with it at least a few times. But it's going to be deteriorating the paste. There's no way around it. But if you're using a water soluble or like a water wash flux, I really wouldn't do that because it's going to start making a pretty noticeable difference. But now a lot of paste nowadays, they're what are called shelf stable and they don't require refrigeration. There was a question if can you still refrigerate them? And you were asking about the GC10. I honestly don't know what the data sheet says off the top of my head about what the temperature range is. We use GC10 a lot, and I have never refrigerated it. And I mean, we don't la we don't have paste that sits out for a while. So, in the two months or so that we've kept paste, it's never had an issue. So maybe you could extend it in a fridge, but I probably wouldn't. I would just use it in whatever range they recommend. So, in another question that I get a lot with having to not use or re-cool down paste. What are you supposed to do if you can't use a 250 gram jar of paste at once? Do you just throw it all away? And I totally get where you're coming from. It makes total sense. So my recommendation on that front is to get a thermally stable paste. And I'll 
mention some recommendations at the end. But if you get a thermally stable paste and you get it in what are called the flow, the pro flow cartridges, they're basically like a cock gun style tube. You can just keep it out at all times, dispense whatever you need, use it for those boards and just throw away the excess there. That way the tube never has to be exposed to the air and you can keep using it for as many boards as you want. And that's actually what we do for prototypes. It's super nice. I mean, we can get, I don't know, like 20, 30 different board runs out of it before we have to replace it. If not, and you have, if you have to refrigerate it, look for a paste that has like a four week time that it can be unrefrigerated. So you take out your paste, you use it for your first set of boards, and you have a month to use it before you have to consider throwing it away. I know it's not a perfect solution, but I think the perfect solution is simply to use the thermally stable. But and keep in mind, again, like I said, these are the rules that the manufacturer recommends, and I totally agree that it makes a difference. But of course, you can fudge this if you're just doing a few boards here and there just as a hobbyist or just messing around. But just keep in mind that it is going to cause deterioration in it. And if you start to have issues, that's probably why the issues are there. So the next thing is paste viscosity. And this is simply just how thick or thin the paste is. And on manufacturer's data sheets, they will absolutely specify this. But it is also my experience that it's an absolute load of garbage and it doesn't actually mean anything and you can't use it to compare and I don't know why that is. It's just been my experience. If the paste is too thin, so it's too watery-like, it's more likely to bridge because it doesn't form as good of a gasket and it leaks out of the apertures. And it definitely will require more frequent stencil cleaning because, again, it leaks out of the apertures. But if the paste is too thick, it's hard to have a consistent bead on the squeegee and you end up like smushing the paste instead of just rolling it out across and it can get stuck in aperture. So you go to pull the stencil up and the paste comes with it instead of staying on the board, which obviously is not what you want. So for hand soldering prototypes, I definitely like a thicker paste because if we're just clamping down a stencil by hand or just using a manual printer, it's a lot harder to get a really good gasket. So using a thicker paste is a lot easier, but if I'm using our full line and we're using it in our printer, I much rather have a little bit thinner paste just because it's going to be perfectly aligned and it makes it so we don't have to clean the stencil as much, but either or you can get away with both of them. And I know this is all relative, what is thin, what is thick, but once you've used a few different pastes, it's pretty obvious to tell. And when I mention the paste that I like, I'll mention the viscosity of each of them, at least as compared to each other. So another one, and I mentioned this before, so I won't go into a ton of detail on this, and this is the stencil life abandon time. So this is how long a paste bead can sit on a stencil while not being used before the flux either evaporates before there starts to be oxidation, anything like that. And when the manufacturer says it has a 16 hour abandon time, they mean eight hours or four hours. They always over, really over exaggerate on this for obvious reasons. And another question that I'd had recently is, is the abandon time how long you can print a PCB and then leave that PCB out before putting it into reflow? And absolutely not, because when it's on a PCB, there's way less flux per aperture, but a lot more surface area. So it's going to evaporate a lot faster. So if you have like an eight hour abandon time on a paste, man, I, I like to get a, I don't like to have a PCB sitting out for more than, I mean, like an hour, maybe a couple, two, three hours. And if you're going to do that, make sure to just cover it and keep it protected from any airflow and hopefully a lower a, uh, a lower air speed and lower humidity. And with the, oh, I jumped ahead, whoops. So there isn't a perfect spec how long paste will last on a stencil board, that's what I just mentioned. 
So with this, if you look at two different data sheets from the same manufacturer, if one says the abandoned time is longer, you can pretty safely assume that that's true. But if you're comparing two different manufacturers and one says eight hours and one says 16, you have no idea because they could be doing a different test in how they determine that. So your mileage may vary with that. It's really hard to compare without testing. And like I had mentioned, the lower the temperature and lower the humidity, the longer the abandoned time will be because it has less chance of absorbing moisture. Again, moisture is the enemy with solder paste. So now cold and hot slump. This is something when I eventually get around to doing the video on this, I wanna get some good videos of this process. But for now, I'll just kind of explain it. So cold slump, when you stencil a PCB onto the apertures, this is the specification for how long and how much the paste will just spread out naturally across the PCB just sitting there. So if you perfectly stencil it onto an aperture after a certain amount of time because of gravity, because of the paste sitting there, it'll want to spread out, it'll want to slump. Hot slump is the exact same thing, except it's how much it will do that in a oven at 150 degrees. 150 degrees, depending on Rojas or non Rojas, is about the time or the temperature that most fluxes will, fluxes, most flux, most of the flux will activate and start to eat away at the oxidation layer. So it will always expand a little bit there, but hot slump is how much. And something, when you just hear that for the first time, you always think that, oh, slump is bad. You don't want it to spread out. For cold slump, totally true. You don't want it just to start leaking out after you print it. And a higher viscosity paste will do better at this because it's thicker, so it doesn't naturally want to slump as much. Hot slump, on the other hand, is actually kind of useful, especially for hand soldering, because if you don't have a perfect aperture that is pasted on there, when it expands, when the flux is activating, it, it helps with the surface tension to pull the paste back onto the aperture. A big disadvantage of hot slump is if you're doing pin and paste, it's a nightmare. We actually had an issue with this when we were doing like 1.27 millimeter pitch through holes on a two by 25 pin header and we were doing pin and paste. We went through, man, like 10 different, five, 10 different paste trying to find one that had a basically the minimum amount of hot slump so it wouldn't spread to different apertures in different holes. And we ended up finding one that worked and it was literally unusable with most paste that do have a decent bit of hot slump. And the manufacturer specs are utterly useless. Every paste manufacturer will say that they passed the IPC test for hot and cold slump, but you cannot compare them because even if they pass, some are terrible at it, some are really good at it, which again sucks. Manufacturers, there's not a good way to compare them. So now we're at the part of the, the lecture at the end to where what are my suggestions? Like I said, I don't like giving paste recommendations just because it's really difficult for doing a overarching idea and thought, but I'll give you what my suggestions are as a generality and kind of what we use. So for leaded, before when we were using leaded, Kester EP256 or 256HA worked really well. The HA is high activity. It seemed to work better with parts which nowadays have a lead-free finish on them. The non-HA sometimes would struggle to wet out some of these parts. And if you were using like a BGA, you would definitely want the HA version. It's a no-clean paste, and it worked really well for us. For lead-free, Loctite GC10 is pretty fantastic. It's thermally stable, so for the prototyping, it's super nice. It is a really thick paste, so for hand stenciling, it's really good. But after, I don't know, after a few months of it sitting out, even just in the ProFlow cartridge, it does start to get thick to the point to where it becomes kind of tough to use. So just keep that in mind. 
Now, OM353 made by Alpha. That's another really good lead-free paste. It's a lot thinner than GC10, and it's not thermally stable. The 353 is what we typically will use for in our assembly line, where the GC10 is what we use for prototypes. I wish Alpha had a in-between GC10 and 353 in viscosity. I think that could be fantastic for both prototyping and for production line work, but alas, they do not. For reworking, we use Chip Quick. I'm not even going to read the part number. It's a bismuth bearing rework solder wire. It does not have flux in the core, so you have to add in some gel or liquid flux to use it. But once you do that for reworking any surface mount or through hole part, it works really well. And I know a lot of people like the first paste that you use is DigiKey sells the Chip Quick solder paste. That was the first solder paste that I started to use. And once you start comparing it with some of the others I mentioned, it's not very good. I'm, I'm not a big fan with it. I know other people have had good luck with it, but in my opinion, it's not even comparable how much worse it is. And then the SN100C, like I said, we use that for through hole soldering. And the Chipquick CQ100GE is the specific series we use. If you want the official licensed SN100C, you have to go with AIM, but it's more expensive naturally, but either or work fine. So now in conclusion, oh, I did not cover up the text that well. Whoops, so I'll just do this. So <laughs> there's a lot more with paste than just meets the eye. It's not usually as simple as just picking the first one that pops up and then going with it, even though it sometimes can work. If you're just doing hobby projects and you're in the United States or a country that isn't Rojas dictated, I would highly recommend just use leaded and make your life a whole lot easier. For a commercial product, sadly, you might have to use lead-free paste. And if you are a CM or an OEM, contact manufacturers. They will almost always send you samples to test with. That's how... I kind of have this much knowledge of different brands and different paste out there because we've used quite a bit of them and I know firsthand which ones work for us and which ones don't. Obviously, if you're a hobbyist, you don't have that luxury typically, but it is what it is and you can get some smaller quantities. I do wish they sold it in smaller quantities for like hobbyists, but I guess that's just such a small market. So yeah, that pretty much wraps it up so let me jump back here and let me go through some questions and one thing just before I do that actually so as like an aside with a surface mount process so like if you're doing it through an assembly line once you have a reflow profile set up I personally find lead free solder just about as easy to use as leaded once the process works it either is going to work or it's not going to. I don't really have an issue with it. For through-hole soldering in like our selective solder, kind of the same thing. It's not that much harder to work with. You have to use nitrogen. Where leaded, you don't have to, so that's a disadvantage. For through-hole hand soldering, lead-free is definitely harder, but if you use the SN100C, it's not too, too bad. The big difference in my mind is rework on like surface mount parts lead free is a lot harder to use you almost have to for a lot of things use the low temperature paste or the low temperature wire to lower the temperature of the paste that's where lead leaded or lead bearing solder whoops is really helpful but once you get things dialed in lead free isn't that terrible to use it just sucks that we have to but anyway, so yes, I will check out what questions we have and go through them. Hopefully this was a decent lecture for the 15 people that watched it. Okay, first question from prefer to remain unknown. Very mysterious. How bad is it to sniff solder smoke? Well, I am not a doctor, so I do not know. 
I don't know. I mean, I think it's one of those things if you're doing it once a month, I'm sure you smell worse things just driving to work and smelling all the exhaust. But if you're soldering six, eight hours a day, it's probably pretty bad to sniff it all day, but you're not going to be smelling or breathing in uh, lead fumes. If you're using leaded solder, you are not breathing in lead. That is another huge misconception. Lead vaporizes at like 1800 degrees. Your soldering iron's at hundreds of degrees. You're just breathing in the flux fumes, which is bad, but it's not lead solder. What is the best and easiest way to clean flux off a board that has been reworked from Daniel? I wish I had a good answer for you. There normally isn't a good way to, just because it depends on what chemistry you're using. And this is where if you are using like a water wash or a water soluble, you can just rewash everything. I typically will try to just use no clean and not wash it because the issue is if you use alcohol or acetone and just brush it, you're not fully cleaning it off. So now you have partially dissolved, partially non-dissolved flux, which probably is worse for the board than just leaving it. So I try not to do it, but it is what it is. From Tin Fever, how do you feel about mixing different alloy solders for example something originally soldered with SAC 305 and reworking with SN 100C does it matter good question so I'd mentioned that briefly but it's something someone had also asked before so I don't do it I try to avoid it the example you mentioned however SAC 305 and SN 100C I don't think it's going to cause any issues but it's so easy not to and just use whatever you soldered it with just don't do it but it's not like if you mix bismuth with lead solder that's a nightmare but just keep that in mind scenic suggested using two different alloys for reflowing two-sided boards i.e high temp one side low temp other side yay or nay if so any special considerations from a heat yes so that is only if you have big and heavy parts on both sides of the board. We do double-sided boards quite a bit. Uh, give me one second. I think I have one I can show you. Be right back. All right, so, and this is one of the other reasons I'm setting up the space back here, so I should be able to, well, never mind. I have a camera set up to show down here, but I don't know why it is not working. It should be. I don't know why it's not. But anyway, so basically... This board, you can see, has tons of parts on the top side. And then you look at the bottom side, it has some small, like, transistor uh, SOT223s. It has a bunch of 0402s here. So basically, if you design a double-sided board to where all big components are on one side and all light components are on the other side... You just do the side that has the small components first, reflow it, flip it over, do the other side, and then send it in with the light components on the bottom, and the surface tension of the paste will hold them up, and you don't have to use any different paste. But if you had a board that had big ICs on both sides, then yes, you either have to glue them down or use low temperature, flip it, high temperature, vice versa. You do high temperature first, flip it, then do low temperature so the high temperature doesn't reflow. Good question. So all the boards we've done, we've always been able to put light components on one side, heavy on the other side, so we've never had to use any different temperature paste, but totally, it's done. It's done all the time. I've heard no clean 
doesn't have to be clean. I've heard no clean only doesn't have to be cleaned if completely heated. Is that true? Does that mean it needs to be cleaned if I apply extra flux paste since I'm probably not thoroughly heating to temp during rework from tin fever? Another fantastic question. So I was not being explicit with my answer to Daniel as to why I don't want to partially clean a board. And one of the main reasons is exactly what you just said. Yes, if your flux is not fully heated, it hasn't been fully activated, and there's a chance that it could remain active and it could cause corrosion. So yes, if you're reworking a board, you ideally want to have it completely heated to burn off any of the volatile substances that could still be there. Oh, a couple questions in the chat. I just got an idea. Like Altium or KeyCAD, definitely KeyCAD, KiteCAD. What should you use to clean? Wait, what? I saw a question about what to clean. Never mind. Someone just said uh, best cleaner but bad for board. Three clear. Yeah. Uh, so another question from submissions. If I wipe off a stencil and have a tin contaminated wipe, is there a proper way to dispose of this? Are hobbyists just throwing old dried out solder paste in the garbage? So I run a business, so sadly we cannot just do that. So over in our solder area, we have a designated red trash can or red bag in a trash can and anything that has touched leaded or unleaded solder goes in there and we take it to a hazardous pickup for businesses in the county because yes you can't just dispose of that again lead free is supposed to be very good for the environment yet you oddly can't throw it directly in the garbage funny how that works is it really that bad to reuse paste as a hobbyist that has been through the stencil already that I think it is. I, I, I don't think that that's something you should do. I would rather you just use a small amount of paste and dump out what was on the stencil because once it's been in the air, it's been rolled on the stencil, it's going to start degrading really rapidly. If you have to reuse it, I would put it in a different jar and then put new paste in that jar and mix it next time you go to use it that's going to be much better than just reusing it directly. You mentioned there's a way to not have warm up cool of solder paste by using the ProFlow tubes. Can you explain this? Remove from fridge. Oh, either I misspoke or you misheard. So the only way that idea works is if it's thermally stable paste. So it's never is in the fridge. If it was in the fridge, then of course you're right. What solvents do you use for cleaning rosin? Oh, that's where I saw it. So for rosin, you typically use a saponifier. Uh, I guess we're out of our saponifiers. Saponifier, like I said, it just dissolves the, or when it comes in contact with rosin, it produces soap, which then cleans everything. If not, you typically will use, <coughs> excuse me, you'll typically use some sort of solvent can't do that legally yeah right out of curiosity how is glued applied a separate stencil no because then it would get paste or glue where you want the other so you typically will use a dispensing machine so after your printer it will dispense it manually and it uses this little like red usually like chip clip chip quick adhesive or you can do it by hand if it's only a couple parts uh, I just noticed that I can make use of the PCB to make motors without any precision machine. All right. Well, that is good. Okay, so that is all of the questions. Let me see if any additional got posted. Yes, a few more. Okay, what solvents? For hobby work, so a board every few months, how much paste would I need when I order a few months? 15, oh, so this is actually a good question. It's not actually the question you asked, but it reminded me of something. So he asked, what size should I order? 15 grams, 50 grams? So the only things, and let me show you one second. So 
So when I had mentioned it sucks that you can't order small amounts of paste. So you can order, like this is a 10 gram tube. This is bismuth bearing solder just for rework. You cannot use, or you should not use paste like this with a stencil. It has a much, much lower viscosity to be able to push out of this tube. So the only paste that is made to be using with a stencil is either a jar, which is usually 100, 250, or 500 grams, or one of the big ProFlow cartridges, which are 600 grams, I believe. Anything else that's in a syringe, it's not designed to be used with a stencil. You can, but the viscosity is so low, it's not going to work very, very well. What about halogens, halines? Yeah, so I mentioned that. That's the other part of Rojas. I didn't cover that just because if you're using a lead-free paste, unless you're using some of the more aggressive water-soluble, it won't have any. But yes, if you're looking into that and you have to be Rojas compliant, of course, make sure you pay attention to those. For water cleaning is sublurbing. Sublurbing boards okay? Oh, I think he meant to use... I think he meant to say submerging boards. Okay, how does that not damage the boards? So water does not damage boards. Uh, water is completely fine to use. It's only if there is impurities in it that makes it conductive. So yes, you can absolutely submerge these boards. You can do it in a dip tank. You can do it in an ultrasonic bath as long as you don't damage components. Or you can do a spray. But as long as it's distilled DI water, it's totally fine. As a hobbyist ordering a stencil, what stentness, stencil thickness should I order with respect to the paste? For surface mount specifically, so that has nothing to do with paste. It has everything to do with parts. Normally, your standard is like 5 or 6 mil, depending on the part size. But yeah, nothing to do with the paste. The only thing that will affect that is the aperture size and making sure that you have the five ball distance. If I do double-sided boards, what should I use? Rojas on one side and bismuth on the other? So that's like the question I answered with Ahid. If you're doing heavy parts on both sides, then yeah, you have to use something that has a lower temperature paste on one side, or you have to glue the parts on one side to the board. Does your county charge a ton for that hazmat? Do they give you funny looks? Do they just, no, it's like they charge per pound. I think every time I go, it's like, I don't know, like a hundred bucks or something. No, no funny looks. That is what the, uh, that's what it's for. It's like the small business waste accumulator, something like that. That's what it's there for. Then how do we use syringes? So this is for rework. So if you're reworking a board and this is low temp paste, so you would squeeze a little bit onto the joint, heat it up with a soldering iron, and then it would combine to lower that temperature to make it easier to remove. You would not use this on a stencil. It seems I've been doing so many things in a less than optimum way. Maybe not a fancy topic, but definitely good information. Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. I'm glad that you, you enjoyed it. Uh, he, DI water equals deionized water for reference. Yeah, I know, distilled, DI, I always kind of combine the two, but yes, that is, that is correct. Okay, let me check one last time, any questions? And if you do have questions now, just post it in the chat because now I'm obviously not doing the live or the uh, lecture anymore. Nope, no more submissions on there. So, does anybody have any other questions? And if not, I think we will call it a stream. I'm glad that at least the people that did tune into this and stuck around seem to find it somewhat useful. That is always the goal. And if you have questions not even related to solder paste, just throw them up here.
Is it okay to keep paste in fridge next to food? The only reason I laugh at that is this is something I've seen on a lot of forums and a lot of questions. So would I keep solder paste in a fridge with food? No, absolutely not. That just, that's not a good idea. Do I actually think that it causes a hazard? No, I mean, <laughs> it's not like you're gonna have lead particles jump out of it and go onto your sandwich. They can't jump out of a container. But no, I wouldn't put it in there. Did you ever use plastic stencils? Yeah, like the captain tape. I used to kind of when I was just doing this like right at the start to save a little bit of money, but it's totally not worth it. They are terrible to use. And especially if you're getting cheap overseas stencils, they're dirt cheap. What if the lead is hungry? Ooh, that is a good question. Then it might actually open up the lid and jump onto your food. But then I think it would go back to the, uh, I could go back to the container after it finished eating. But I guess that is a good point. So maybe that's the reason why it shouldn't be in the same fridge. I meant 3D printed stencils. Oh, absolutely not. Again, you have to, you have to keep in mind, like I do this as a profession, so it doesn't make sense to try to save money like that if it's going to cost more time or not work. So now everything we do is going to be with metal stencils. Also, do you make your own stencils? No, we order them. All right, well then, seems like the last question. So I will call it a stream. So yeah, I'll, uh, I have a video mostly set up and done. I was going to have it up this week or last week, but moving everything around kind of delayed that. So hopefully next week or two, I'll have a video up and then after that, we'll do another live stream. But of course, I will keep everybody updated on that. So. I will see everybody in the next video or the next stream, and I will talk to you then. Have a good one, guys.